Hi, I'm Stephanie Bass. And I'm Donald Montgomery. And you're in Mixed Company. Welcome to Mixed Company, a podcast discussing mixed race identity uh, and discussing the politics of race respectfully and com- comfortably in a m- mixed racial company. Um, on the podcast today is Charlottesville, one year later. Hey, Donald. Oh, hi. How are you? Uh, oh my goodness, I'm I'm okay. Uh, this is a bit of a it's a bit of a rough topic, but we'll get through it. Yeah, this is a bummer episode. Mm-hmm. It also might be a little longer. Because we have some history to get through, and we want to, of course, give our take on it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was it was a pretty big um, issue, mm-hmm. and I think it still is because a lot of it's unresolved. So, well, yeah, and the reason why um, we wanted to talk about it today because there is the Unite the Right rally part two. Yeah, I know that that's the- happening this weekend. It's happening right now as we speak. Oh, great! So, we wanted to make sure that. Because it's fairly topical for what we talk about on this podcast, so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anytime, anytime, sort of like, you know, a mass group of of white supremacists gets together um, and decides it's going to. Well, and especially these ones because they get so much media attention, right? Like, it's yeah, exactly. Like we like you don't hear on the news every time the Klan has a rally and burns something down, but this one garnered a lot of attention because it was violent, but it was also really tragic. Yeah. And so I just want to make sure that we are covering the things that we need to cover, right? Like, right. I feel that I need to cover this. So, no, I think that's we're going to do it. So, why don't we start with sort of like a, a brief breakdown of, of what happened a year ago? So, start at the beginning? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> All right. So, um, what we're talking about today is the Charlottesville rally or slash riot. I don't really know how to phrase it, um, which happened in August, mid-August of 2017, last year. Um, and the reason for the riot, the, I don't want to call it a rally, riot. The reason for the rally was um, because uh, in sort of the wake of the shooting in, in Charleston in 2015, um, there was a movement in the United States to remove um, Confederate monuments that were put up um, and they wanted to take statues of noted Confederates like Robert E. Lee and um, stuff out of public, out of public places. There was also a move to get rid of the Confederate flag that was flown in a bunch of places, especially in um, South Carolina where Charleston is because yeah. the Confederate flag is a part of the state flag. Yeah. And so that was a movement to do that. And then there was a backlash from that movement to want to get rid of those Confederate monuments um, for people that wanted to respect and and, um, maintain and protect Confederate heritage. And history was a lot of what people who were against the taking down of these monuments, like, oh, we got to maintain the history um, of the Confederacy and the Civil War, and that was a lot of why people did not want to get rid of these statues. Do you yeah. remember that? Yeah, you think that was kind of like s- Southern pride on display? Well, no, like... because we talk about that here in Canada, because I remember last year at a meeting, um, and my union, because I work in a unionized environment, um, put out a statement saying that we didn't want any schools to be named after Sir John A. Macdonald anymore, right? Because of his his role in the sort of attempted genocide and colonialization of Indigenous people, and well, so I think the fervor of that getting rid of Confederate monuments made us reflect on the monuments that we have. Because in our hometown, we have a statue of John A. Macdonald. Um, one of the biggest high schools in the city is named after John A. Macdonald, and so um, that moment in the United States sort of cultural zeitgeist was something that we could reflect on ourselves and like oh should we have schools named after this guy as well well i mean just just recently in the news i think last week there was a story about a uh john a mcdonald um statue in a town in british columbia and they Mm -hmm. voted they voted to remove it 
and now there's going to be rallies in front of it to to you know no we need to keep it we need to keep it because he's an important you know historical yeah. figure etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think you know again it's kind of the divorcing of who the person actually was and what they did you know mm-hmm. cuz you know john a mcdonald yeah he lived in a different time and from the perspective of canada he did some great things historically and you you know you read a history book in in the any of the schools and he's he's this great guy but then when you actually look at what he really did as well uh with regard to indigenous people and stuff like that he did some pretty awful things his government yeah, was responsible and, yeah his for, government was responsible for a lot of laws and stuff like that that were really terrible and yeah. so i think that that whole movement in 2015 sort of bled across the border and there was a backlash to that and we've talked about backlashes before and i think we should do a whole episode oh on yeah the idea of black backlash and so that's what the charlottesville rally was organized to do it was to protect a statue of robert e lee in this university town in virginia and so you found a really good timeline of the events it was a wapo Article? Yeah, Washington Post. Um, if you just do, if you go to the Washington Post website, or um, I think we have it on the blog, the, yep, the link, it's on, right? It's yeah, it's going to be on the blog. Yeah, so it's going to be on the blog. But if you go to the Washington Post website and just search for uh, Charlottesville timeline, uh, that should bring up the um, the uh, the article. And essentially, I mean, it kind of gives you an, an idea of where things started. So, I mean, basically, basically what what began as kind of a Friday night march with Richard Spencer and the, the, the Unite the Right, so like the alt-right groups and the white supremacists. Um, I mean, the thing is, is that the alt... What happened with them on the, the Friday? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, sorry, that's okay. So, so basically, um, they get there. And, um, you know, they essentially organize this big march and they've got their tiki torches and they're, you know, in, in, in a sense, they're actually, there's a bunch of them that are armed and armored. They're wearing... Um, helmets they're they're they've got shields they've got sticks you know that type of stuff yeah i'm um, glad that you talked about their armor because i know that you did some research on the uh, alt right uniform the unite the right yeah. quote unquote so, uniform yeah so when you're looking when you look at the pictures here's what you see you see a bunch of khakis and white shirts and um you know that got me thinking. So I actually looked to see, and GQ had an article about this as well, about the uniform of white supremacy. And that got me thinking. And so I started doing image searches on Google for um, Nazi propaganda. Mm-hmm. Which is turn- always a fun way to spend your weekend. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially the sources that where you find these things. Because let me tell you. We have to tell the story of the <sighs> link. We were looking for links to put on the blog. And... Um, Donald was like, oh, I found this great lady. It has like all his stuff. And it was this art gallery in Italy. And I said, this art gallery has a lot of Nazi artists in it. (laughs) And he were like, oh, do you think it's like a fascist thing? (laughs) And then we did a little research and a little translating because my Italian's not great. And it was a fascist art gallery that is run by um, the Association of Thule. Um which is all about maintaining and preserving Nordic heritage. Which yeah. Is, um, so we did not include that link. <laughs> yeah. But if you do uh, an image search for an artist named Felix Albrecht, um, so like if you search his name and you include either the German word Erwacht, uh, which means awake or awaken. Then you will get enough you'll get pictures him. and you don't need to click on yeah. the fascist websites like we did. Exactly. And now yeah. we're probably on a list. We're saving you from that problem. <laughs> We're saving you from the exposure. Yeah, we to... we don't all need to be on a list. Yeah, exactly. But what what was interesting is is that from a very early time in the 1930s, um, Nazis were using the image of you know white men with clean shaven faces and like like clean hair, you know, the shaved side hair and the longer top, uh, white shirts, brown pants, tucked in, mm-hmm. clean, crisp, you know, very. Like that image. Yeah, and it was the clothing of the worker. Exactly. The Volk. Yeah, the Volk. And so, and all of their sort of civilian propaganda sort of shows that type of thing. You know, light pants, white shirt. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And mm-hmm. so it was interesting to me to see that um, correlation. It's mm-hmm. not a straight line. I mean, you know, enough times passed that... It's an inspiration, right? Yeah, like, but it's you part can of definitely the... tell... Yeah. That they're going for a certain look. Yeah. And a button-up white shirt and pants is very 1940s worker. 
but it's also not shabby, right? Yeah. So there's an air of professionalism. Yeah. They're professional Nazis, right? Like, <laughs> God. So there's an air of professionalism with having that outfit, right? And so I thought that that was really interesting when you were talking, when you were telling me about that. Um, and then, of course, you have the crazy people that decided to come with rifles and camo. Yeah, so... You know, not even urban camo, just straight up woods camo, which I don't know how that's going to hide you on a college campus. You might as well have dressed up like a hipster playing hacky sack. That would have been better camo. Yeah, but I mean, when people when people show up in basically army gear with mm-hmm. rifles that yeah. are like... I mean, they didn't show up with like double barrel shotguns. They showed up with AR-15s. Like, uh, they're basically uh, single action. Um, the gun of the American people. Sorry, yeah. that was rude. No, no, no. <laughs> Semi-automatic M16s. Yeah. They don't look like hunting rifles. They look like they assault They look like war- wartime rifles, right? Exactly. So when you have people showing up like that to, quote unquote, keep the peace and protect free speech. Um, they were dressed for war. Yeah. And the police, Some of the people. And the police didn't really just, they didn't go after them. They weren't really happy they were there, but they didn't say, no, you can't be here, go away. Yeah. They just said, well, we're not going to get into that because we're scared we're going to get shot. So there was a permit for all these guys to meet and congregate yeah. at this park in the middle of campus. And so you have the professional Nazis and you have... Different groups of white supremacists. There was a whole bunch of them. They weren't all under the same sort of white supremacy. Um, well, they're under the same white supremacy umbrella, but they all have different sort of rules for being a member. So there was, um, I have a list here. They were like neo-Nazis that were called, um, there's, so there's the neo-Confederates. There were people from the Ku Klux Klan. There were neo-Nazis, so people that identify as that, and skinheads. Yeah. And there were this new group, the alt-right, which is um, a social media-based um, yeah. white supremacist group, hate group. There were also various hate-related militias, so people that are sort of white supremacists to the max. They're, like, very militant, and they have the weapons, and they fight and train so that they could be that arm yeah. of white supremacy. And so there were all these people that were just converging on this small town's park. And then, of course, there was the reaction to it, right? Yeah. And I mean, like Antifa has been very um, uh, active in counter-protesting. So Antifa is the short form for anti-fascism or the anti-fascists movement. And they don't play. <laughs> they don't play. So if a white supremacist is going to bring a stick, they're going to bring a stick too. Yeah, it's interesting because um, in a lot of the news coverage, the Antifa sort of quote unquote weapons were defense weapons, right? Yeah. Like they didn't bring AR-15 rifles, but they did bring shields. Yeah. And they did bring air horns and they did bring other sorts of defense mechanisms to sort of counteract what was happening, right? So you have this very, like, far-right group and this pretty far-left group, and both sides are willing to use violence. Yeah, one is willing... One is willing to use the violence, and the other one is willing to defend themselves with violence if necessary. Exactly. Like, Antifa is, is very clear that they don't... They don't support, um, in, like, um, starting things, mm-hmm. but they don't also support rolling over if someone else goes yeah. after them. And we sound like Antifa sort of sympathists, sympathizers, and I'm not really sure if I've sort of figured out what my feeling is about Antifa. I mean... It's it's not easy. It's yeah. not a simple cut in and dry. In this instance, in the Charlottesville instance, I think that I think that the Antifa activists that were there, the counter protesters, they did a lot of good. Like um, they, I was watching CNN that weekend, and I watched a lot of CNN that weekend and with some members of the clergy. And at one point, all the clergy people were standing, singing this little light of mine, and. Um, 
a lot of the the right, the alt right, and the the fascist and the white supremacists were trying to um, physically harm this. And he's an elderly man, and this line of clergy members. And what Cornel West says um, on CNN is, 20 of us who were standing, many of them clergy, we would have been crushed like cockroaches if it were not for the anarchists and the anti-fascists who approached over 350 anti-fascists. The neo-fascists had their own ammunition, and um, this is very important to keep in mind because the police, for the most part, pulled back. And so there were these clergy members and elderly people who were just standing peacefully arm in arm, and they were about to be overrun maybe violently assaulted and the police didn't do anything and then antifa they and the anti-fascists and the anti um uh the anarchists they were the ones that provided the physical protection well and i think that's really important to note in this case because in charlottesville i mean there's definitely oh is it important to note sorry <laughs> um, it's i i i found it very um very important because the the police for the most part were bystanders they were watching but they weren't interfering and they weren't separating and they weren't protecting anybody i wouldn't use the word interfering because it's their job to protect unfortunately to protect everybody right like yeah. which is difficult well they weren't separating anybody i know but that's the thing right that would have been the protective measure yeah and so there is a lot of, I think there's a lot of criticism of the police. Yeah. So um, then the next day, you get the death of Heather Heyer. Mm -hmm. uh, she was hit by a car. Yeah. Um, so she was an anti-racist protester. And um, she basically was in a group and a guy plowed into a mass of people. Yeah. He killed her. She died of blunt force trauma to the chest, but he injured at least 20 other people or something in so. some way. Yeah. Either by people jumping out of the way or him actually hitting them. Yeah. Um, there's other, there are other circumstances of violence. There's DeAndre Harris's story. He was in a parking garage and he was assaulted by four people. And the thing that really, the bee in my bonnet <laughs> about the DeAndre Harris situation is that he was assaulted and then a warrant was put out for his arrest because he had hurt one of the people who was assaulting him by defending himself yeah. and a friend. And so he was arrested and went on trial and eventually he was acquitted. But it took all of that. But he was arrested for being attacked and by himself. four people and then hurting one of the people who attacked him because... He happened to be stronger. Yeah. And I that just boggles my mind. So if if people are trying... Like, that's systemic racism, right? The overt yeah. interpersonal racism was those four guys beating up this black guy in a garage. Yeah. And then the systemic racism is that that black guy gets arrested... Because of it. ...for defending himself. Yeah. And has to go through the rigmarole of, you know, the American justice system as a black guy... And then he was acquitted, thank goodness. But I don't know if that would have been the outcome if there wasn't such, if it wasn't such a visual case. Like there was a lot of scrutiny when that happened. And video evidence. Yeah, but there was a lot of scrutiny. And so I think that because there was scrutiny that it was a favorable outcome. But yeah. So anyways, that is my issue with that assault case is that that man ended up being arrested as well. Which obviously makes me mad because I was a little passionate there. Yeah. But Sorry the, about that. But I mean, you also see things like video of police in riot gear who are holding a line. Mm -hmm. um, and the white supremacists with their shields and their batons and their helmets are pushing up against them. And like like in a phalanx sort of thing. And yeah, this, nobody got hit on the head with a baton. If that had been a group of like Black Lives Matter protesters or something like that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the police would have hauled out their, their sticks and just wailed on people. That's what I'm saying. And nobody got hit with a baton. Yeah. Now, I mean, after that, the uh, the police did clear the, the area. So, I mean, they actually did react. But for a good bit there, you know, there was this whole push on them. And they were just like, 
Well, I guess we'll see what happens. I don't blame the individual officers because no. the, the police is like a military, right? And so if that happens, then you can't expect them to like perform a mutiny, right? Like they have to listen to what their superior officer says. Yeah. And so, I mean, those individual police officers, I don't know what they thought of the situation. I'm sure a lot of them were like, this is stupid. We need to do something. But at the same time, you can't go against your superior officer. That's not how it works. Exactly. And so I think that when people are critical of the police, we need to put the responsibility squarely where it should lie. And that's with the CO and the lieutenants and sergeants that are in charge of those sort of, you know, beat cops and, and other police officers that had to be there. Yeah. Right. They had to follow their orders, which sucks. Yeah. Especially because when that it's... puts you in a really tight spot. Right. Yeah. And I mean, the because the light was shown on that so very strongly, I mean, it you know, I just don't want it to seem like we're ragging on those police officers because I'm not. No. I know that that's a hard job and I know that there were probably black police officers in there and they just had to like yeah, sit to there and take it, right? And so um, the responsibility in my head um, is for the people that called the shots. They didn't call the right shots, right? Yeah. And so I think that that um, is a kind of important distinction because a lot of the time people are um, like when people are like, oh, you don't care about the cops. Yeah, I do. Yeah. However, sometimes the higher ups make terrible calls, right? And um, I, I don't want this to seem like uh, we're at war with the police because we're not, because we need them for protection. And Absolutely. So, I mean, they have to be any any sort of change in, in the way law enforcement operates, any sort of systemic changes. I mean, that's they have to be part of that. But I mean, that being said, I'm still afraid of them. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, but there's also I mean, it's it's. It's definitely, I mean, there's reason for that because yeah. you've had experience, right? I know, but I was like, so that's going to be a little bit of a difficult thing to yeah. to go with. Um, in my notes, it says I should have some sort of tiki torch joke, but I don't. Yeah, I know. After we go through it, it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> it's not really funny. I'm pretty sure tiki torch jokes have been done to death. I did like that, the brand of tiki torch that was being used that... That company tweeted, "Hey, no, we yeah. we just want you to use these for barbecue." So yeah. I thought that that was great, because um, <laughs> uh, that's not their intended uses, guys. So well, and they did get made fun of a lot for using them, rightly so. Well, exactly. I mean, come on, guys. So, um, but I will never look at those torches the same. No. I went to a party and my friend had them and she's like, should we put these out? And I was like, no, nope. <laughs> let's just use flashlights. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. So um, there you go. That's my tiki torch reflection. There we go. So that's that's basically sort of an overview, a short overview of what happened. And by all means, if you, you know, um, it's not it's not comprehensive. So, you know, I, we, I thought it was pretty comprehensive. Oh, it's good. It's not extensive. There you go. That's the word but I was But I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. So now, like, if you want to learn more, just, you know, go and look at the blog and, oh, and man. look at the links. Don't and, Google it. You'll be there for days. Yeah. And, and sort of, you can comb through a lot of the uh, the information. We've sort of consolidated some sources for you. Yeah. And, I mean, we are very sort of um, liberal, left-leaning people. And so if you want something a little more balanced, I'm sure that there are places out there that do that. I know that. I think the guardian in london is pretty balanced yeah um bbc to a yeah point. um Reuters. yeah um so if if people are like oh yeah but you're looking i am looking at it from a lens of i'm a black woman yeah and so so and then i mean you know like the more sources you have wait i'm not black i'm mixed race <laughs> you identify as a black woman i do Anyway, <laughs> so, um, but moving on. Yeah. So, so the more sources you can look at, the better it is, um, because you'll get a spectrum from one end to the other Yeah, and then you can make your own decisions. Yeah. I unfortunately read some of the rights angle on this. That was a little rough. <laughs> so I did not enjoy it. No, of course <laughs> not. And that's actually a great segue to move on to sort of the reaction portion of what happened after Charlottesville. So. Sorry for that abrupt finish, but I decided that this is quite a heavy episode that needed to be in two parts. 
So we're going to stop right now. And if you're interested in and hearing about the reactions to the Charlottesville rally, um, you can listen to part two, um, which will be posted at the same time. So you don't have to wait. Um, but just because the podcast is over doesn't mean that the conversation stops. We would love to hear your comments, reflections, and questions on what you thought about our analysis and sort of historical recount of the Charlottesville rally in 2017. So you could do that by visiting our blog at imcpodcast.blogspot.com, um, or you can tweet to us at imcpodcast. If you're a Facebook user, we have a page there too. It's facebook.com slash imcpodcast. New episodes upload every Sunday. Our theme song is Righteous Fight by Angara. And thanks for listening. <laughs>